Okay, bottom of 14. As individual poem, however, focusing on what Aristotle lists as the least important parts of tragedy, Milos and Opsis, music and image, highlight top of 15. The lyric continues to yearn for wisdom, connecting that primordial yearning with its memory of the unfallen garden. For ultimately, the lyric reveals the secret of the heart of poetry that, as Dante has made us see, it seeks not only the face of Beatrice, but the blindingly bright visage of the supreme being. Stop. Coleridge discerned this lyric insight at the beginning of his poetic act, designating it as the primary imagination. I want you to circle primary imagination. Actually, highlight primary imagination, the repetition of the finite mind of the eternal act of creation and the infinite I am. Keep highlighting. Its mark is eros, desire, and behind that desire is the hunger for insight, for the wisdom that is the invisible reality of being. Um, so in the margin, I want you to write that lyric seeks the face of God. It seeks the face of God in the image of the beloved. This is the kind of knowing that Jacques Maritain has spoken of simply as poetry, finding it to be the basis of all the arts. Art continues in its own way the labor of the divine creation, he writes. It speaks of an immense and primal preconscious life, resembling the primal diffused light first created before God made the lights in the firmament to divide the day from night. In its essence, then, perhaps we can maintain the lyric imaginal world is the Primordial, highlight this, sorry. The lyric imaginal world is the primordial, the moment of creation, a fullness of being, of joy. Stop. In Bede's account, the fabled poet Cademan has been unable to sing until a stranger appeared and commanded him. And on Cademan's question, what shall I sing? The angel, his visitor, responded, sing creation. Highlight. And the lyric does indeed sing creation. We could have no perceivable world without the lyric. It is the jar around which, as Wallace Stevens puts it, the slovenly wilderness arranges itself. Its chief importance for the human community is its ability to engender a sense of both eminence and transcendence. It goes beyond the boundaries of ordinary thought. Did it not descend so deep, it could not rise so high. Stop. Circle eminence and transcendence. At its peak, the lyric process implies more that can be encompassed by the senses or even the ratiocinative power, suggesting an invisible order, though one dependent upon sensation for its realization. Shelley is so overcome by this very real dimension, which he addresses as intellectual beauty, that he makes the mistake of yielding to it on its own terms and abandoning human li limits. The temptation to enter the transcendent realm, to become an angel, to become, in a sense, an angel without connection to the matter is the dislocation Tate has designated the angelic imagination. Highlight. What keeps the poet firmly rooted in the finite, yet still in touch with the cloud of unknowing that envelops physical phenomena, is a symbolic imagination. Or rather, as Tate's own writing suggests, the sacramental imagination. Without the lyric to testify to this invisible order of being, an entire age gradually becomes insensitive to the numinous. Stop. Circle numinous there at the end. Um, numinous means indicating the presence of the divine. Um, if you go up in the paragraph a little bit to the word ratiocinative, right in the middle of the paragraph, you see it? Circle that word ratiocinative, right after it says 
senses or even ratiocinative. It means the process of logical reasoning. Okay, so what this paragraph, I think this is a difficult paragraph to understand. What this paragraph is trying to say is that it, the lyric doesn't speak just to our, just to, um, our, sen our senses, like it doesn't speak just to our logic, and it doesn't want us to become fully angelic. So there's a happy medium between being completely ground in the city and being completely out in the angelic world. You see what I'm talking about? So there's this, there's this, this touch of the divine in, in the lyric, but it's not completely out of this world. Because remember in the poem uh, Birches that we want to climb as high as we can, but we also want our weight to set us back down again into the earth because earth is the right place for love, it says. Um, and then if we get too far into what Tate calls the angelic imagination, we lose touch with what is happening in the world. And then we become like monks sitting in Tibet, just praying all day. We're not in touch with the world as it is. The poet has to be in touch with the city so he can speak to the things of the city so he or she can give us power to fight the thing that is the city. Does that make sense? What are, what are the things of the city? He talks about it back here. Page, wow, five. Will there will always be wars and rumors of wars. There will always be poor. There will always be destitute. There will also be... There will always be public scandal, corruption, broken homes, deserted children. So the poet has to be in touch with those things. So I can speak to those things with the divine, with a sense of the divine. That makes sense? Otherwise, it's just pure philosophy. It's just like, yes, you should sit in, you should go, go to the mountains and sit there and hum and sing to the birds. I mean, that'd be great for a while, but you're not in touch with the world, so you don't know how to help people with your writing. Top of 16. We are almost done, you guys, with Dr. Cowan completely. Two and a half pages. Well, not completely, but, you know, reading her essays. The loss of the numinous, which is the connection to the divine, okay, this loss is expressed first in the poets themselves who utter their disillusion and disgust with the present order, calling the epoch to a new, entirely secular worldview. The other genres then begin to reflect the lyric negativity, the culture gradually losing touch with the invisible world, its religious impulses going in two radically different directions. Highlight that. The culture gradually losing touch with the invisible world. Its religious impulse is going two radically different directions, one headed toward a kind of moralistic narcissism, the other toward a fanatical fundamentalism in an attempt to preserve the otherworldly aspects of faith. This, alas, seems to characterize our present moment, present state. Stop. This is important because if you lose a connection with like what religion really is, which is grounded in the divine, then what are you? You're a moralist who loves yourself. You have made yourself God and you are there to tell everybody else how to live. Right? Um, I read a lot of books about this kind of stuff and uh, it seems like people are leaving the church because they're tired of being told how to live when the people who are telling them how to live aren't also living that way. I think generally we call that hypocrisy. And it's not grounded in a sense of like, like if you're a Christian, it's not grounded in a Christ-centered life. It's just like, just because you've made yourself an elder of the church means you can tell me what to do. Um, so it's, that's what she calls a moralistic narcissism. And then this fanatical fundamentalism where you make rules the center of your religion. Make sense? And so it's not numinous. It's not connected to the divine. It's, con it's, it's centered on the human as God or it's centered on rules as God. And that's why a lot of people, especially people y'all's age and just a little older, are really just not, not wanting to go to church. Or you don't feel like there is a God because the people who are supposed to represent God, you're like, this is what God is? You haven't been given a, given a, good, man, a good sense of the leadership, so 
That's what she's saying. Next paragraph. Highlight. There can be no genuine sacramental life for a society, no genuine culture without the lyric, and the lyric itself cannot exist without a lively sense of the transcendent. Stop. In other words, you can't have the lyric if you don't have some sort of touch with the divine or, the, or chaos that exists outside the city. In our time, we have seemed to have arrived at the place where the modernist poets predicted, where in T.S. Eliot's words, the dead men have lost their bones. Ours is an age of disrobing. Lyric poets, having divested themselves of the garments of another age, are now tearing away at the body beneath. Many recent poets resort to a long listing of names and objects in an attempt to regain the thinginess of things. Others continue their frantic search for the wholeness of the garden state. Highlight. It is tempting to say that the lyric impulse can never completely disappear from the human community, that someone among us will always be called to utter the Lord's song in a strange land. <clears throat> Stop. And early 20th century Russia seems to have borne out this optimism. Highlight. Tyranny and oppression may perhaps make the lyric flourish, even if it has to be composed in concentration camps with only memory as preservation. Stop. But then one recalls 18th century England, where reason and good sense harness the lyric impulse for its own purposes, where the lyric po gifts of the such poets as Pryor, Dryden, and Pope were used to pave the way for the triumph of ratiocination rather than sacramentality. England was de deprived of a true lyric voice for more than 100 years at the time of crucial development for Europe. What she's saying is that right before the Romantic poets, which were studying, um, that you had these ratiocinative poets, which were grounded in basically human reason. So it wasn't connected to the divine. It was grounded in like the human as man as God. And that she says that the England lost its sense of the numinous in that time period with these kind with the poets Dryden, Pope, and um, Pryor. As Tate's poem, Mr. Pope, suggests, in a time strict with the glint of pearl and gold sedans, Pope, the deformed genius, was able to conform to the strictures of poetic diction. But he who dribbled couplets like a snake, coiled to a lithe precision in the sun, possessed more poetic genius than the age could permit. One cannot say Tate's poem continues what prompted his wit and rage, but around a crooked tree a moral climbs whose name should be a wreath. Pope's poetic genius was used for moral instruction rather than lyric song. When the lyric resurfaced half a century later, the English language had been fatally split. Poets began writing in an unmitigated language of feeling that would issue, eventually issue what T.E. Holm termed a wet style, as if treacle had been spilled on the table. In the 20th century, highlight, in the 20th century, the disappearance of the poet from the general assembly of voices determining the common destiny is dangerous indeed. Keep highlighting. Like the canary in the coal mine, the lyric is a fragile indicator of whether the air in a society is fit to breathe. Lyric's languor may be, like the canaries, an indication of hopeless pollution. Stop. Okay, circle the word languor. It means idleness or a lack of energy. You know what the canary in the coal mine is, uh, does, right? Like literally what the canary does? If you have a coal mine that you think is um, has toxic fumes inside, you send a canary in. And if the canary comes out, it's, the, it's okay. But if the canary doesn't come out, that means the, the coal mine is um, toxic and people shouldn't go in. Um, and so she's saying that the, the lyric is the indicator of whether society is a place that's fit to breathe. Hope is the thing with feathers, Emily Dickinson remarks in one of her lyrics, making overt the subliminal connection of the bird with that eternal spring within the human breast. Throughout the ages, the persistence of bird imagery in lyric poetry, Harding's freezing little thrush uttering its unlikely affirmation, Keats's nightingale redeeming an entire history of inequality and grief, Frost's crow, Plath's black rook, Hopkins' ecstatic windover, these point to the genre as an indicator of society's most constant, if fragile, optimism. Highlight, more than its erotic drive, erotic meaning eros or a love, pursuit of extreme um, freedom, more than its celebration of beauty, keep highlighting, the lyrics expectation, excuse me, for some sort of blessedness underlies even its most poignant laments, poignant meaning sharp. For the lyric utterance is a response to the gift of life, the first joyous cry celebrating existence, stop. 
Adam's voice when he sprang upright from the dust, Eve's when she found herself separate and entire. These utterances before the fall are the intonations underlying the lyric voice, whatever its purported expectations, its chosen stance. Highlight. Lyric remembers wholeness, longs for it, and hopes in its return. Keep highlighting. So when the canary stops singing, we know things are really ominous. Ominous meaning, you know, dreadful. And frighteningly enough, that seems to be the possibility for the lyric in our society today. Stop. It seems to have been totally committed to what Donald Davidson called the guarded style, guarded from any expression of feeling or faith or hope, only available to intellectuals and not the general population. To be sure, a lyric may once again blossom as it gave signs, gives signs of doing in popular culture. Its high form, however, requires readers who can understand the obliquity of its language. Hear its hidden music and be moved by its plaints. Highlight, for lyric is dissatisfied with the way things stand and, as I have maintained, is either apocalyptic or nostalgic. The latter hearkening back to the way we were, to a subliminal memory of the virtual garden state and the formal to a final consummation. But whatever the condition of the community, the lyric poet is enjoined to sing, as W.H. Auden exhorts, the poet of human unsuccess in a rapture of distress. Stop. Next page. Oh, Dr. Cowan, here we go. Top of 18. Highlight. So, though lyric remains virtually impotent in the practical affairs of society, it is necessary to human culture. A protection of the channel between word and thing, between heaven and earth, elevating the human to the workings of the spirit. Stop. As poet and artist, the lyricist is on our side against the terror of the numinous, calming the pounding heart as we approach the burning bush, whereas the mystic and prophet are on the side of the holy against us, judging our sins and our failings. Highlight, the lyric cry is the last thing we have between ourselves and annihilation, and as such, it is the cornucopia from which human culture issues. Stop. It was in Adam's voice when he named the animals, in Eve's when she lamented the loss of Eden, in Mary's when she accepted the annunciation of the angel. It encompasses our joys and our griefs. It is our nostos, our story, our homecoming. It is our word which will stand with us till the last day. <clears throat> Highlight, and in the meantime, its task is to keep our inner being in touch with the cosmos. Stop. As Howard Nemiroff writes in his poem, The Blue Swallows. Poems are not the point. Finding again the world, that is the point, where loveliness adorns intelligible things because the mind's eye lit the sun. <laughs>